it's my privilege to be able to welcome uh, our first keynote speaker. And uh, we're delighted to welcome Steve Wheeler as our opening keynote to set the tone here at Alt-C. And uh, I think Steve is well known to many of us uh, for his innovative and challenging work on the digital student experience and the impact that the technology used to support learning should have on pedagogy. And I know he's got some um, exciting ideas to share with us today. Steve is an associate professor from Plymouth University down on the southwest coast. And he's also brought two of his students along to join him with uh, uh, sharing in the keynote. That's Rebecca and Kate. So, and Steve, I should add also, apart from all the other uh, description of him in your welcome pack, he's also chair of the European Distance E-Learning Network and just recently fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. And uh, so please do welcome Steve Wheeler. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I didn't expect this gig. Marin invited me and uh, I had to come. You can't say no to Marin, can you? But uh, here's what I'm going to do today. Um, I'm only going to speak for a while, and, and, and then I want to bring my students up. You, you said I'm bringing all, all my students with me. I've only got two of them. If I brought them all, they'd more than double this, uh, this congregation here today. But, um, but uh, the, the, thank you for coming, you two, and we'll be seeing you shortly. Um, I've got a lot of memories of Alt C. Who, who's here for the first time? Who are, the, who are Alt, Alt virgins? <laughs> that's quite a few. That's, that's quite a lot, isn't it? So, so um, that, that's amazing. I, I first came to Alt about 1997, I think it was. And uh, so I've got lots of memories of Alt. I haven't been for about three years, but um, do you remember Fault? The fringe alt with the little um, star, um, the little, little kind of, what, what were they? They were kind of like Space Invader badges that Francis Bell made. Hello, Francis, if you're watching. Um, do you remember the, the VLE is dead debate? <laughs> people, people literally shouting at each other and pointing fingers across the room at each other. It was amazing, wasn't it? It's was great fun. And uh, 150 people crammed into an 80-seater room and 30 more turned away. It was quite amazing. Um, Martin been on this very stage, being blinded by the glare of the apple from Diana Lorillard's laptop. Remember that? <laughs> Donald Clark with his don't lecture me lecture. <laughs> and the subsequent, the subsequent Twitter storm. It was amazing. Um, you know, polarized the audience. Uh, Hans Rosling balancing precariously on top of a huge stepladder. Remember that? Pointing a stick at the screen. And poor old Seb Schmoller grimly hanging on below. A whole of his career flashing in front of his life. You know, so, you know mentally kind of balancing his, you know, um, his, 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 the kind of the, um, the, the indemnity insurance agreements and, 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 and wondering about visits from, you know, the, the lawyers and, and so on. It, these, these are all memories of, of, of Alt. These are all part of the, the culture of Alt. And, and Alt-C is, is just an amazing event. This is probably one of the most knowledgeable audiences for learning technology that, that you'll ever see. There's, there's two or three that I could mention, and this is probably one of the top ones. But um, today, really, what I want to do is to try and talk to you about um, the future of learning in terms of who we're dealing with now, the, the students that are coming in through our doors. The students that are coming in through your doors this year are going to be probably students that don't remember the last century. That's the century that you and me were, were, were born in. That's the century that you and me were educated in. And learning, I'm going to say to you, is changing. That's my argument today. Learning is changing. Not at a fundamental level. At the fundamental level, we all know that learning occurs when neurons connect and, and, and we make connections and so on. That, that's a fundamental level of learning. That's never going to change. That's biological. But at, at a kind of a psychological level and also I think at a, an operational level, I think that learning is, is changing in many ways. And I'll try and show you what I mean by that as we go through this, this presentation. Here's part of the problem that we've got. When we try and look at the future, when we try to look at what is coming, when we try to um, anticipate what's next, we get the problem that Voltaire talks about here. It's a psychological problem. It's a, what, what I suppose in psychology you would call fixity. Uh, you can't break out of the box. You can't see things in a new way because you're still stuck in the old culture that you're used to. And 
This kind of comes out in all sorts of new technologies. When, when Alexander Graham Bell um, allegedly invented the telephone, there were several others that had claim to that. He had the best lawyers. But um, when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he, he, he made this startling statement. I truly believe that one day every town in America will have a telephone. And he was right. Wasn't he? You go to America, every town has a telephone. What he couldn't foresee, of course, was, was all the kind of the... Um, the miniaturization, the satellites, um, digitization. He couldn't, he couldn't see for that far down the corridor. So when you try and make predictions that are sweeping about the future, you end up looking quite ridiculous because there are things that happen which um, you don't anticipate. Um, here, here's a picture um, by a French artist called Villemar, painted in 1910. This is education in the year 2000, according to him. You see what he's done? It's interesting, isn't it? He's working off the old model of transmission, and of course that doesn't happen in universities now, does it? <laughs> but you see, what he's got here, he's got new technology that he's, he's incorporating. And uh, I thought about this as a total transmission model until I was listening to Audrey Waters. Hello, Audrey, if you're watching. Um, you're last year's keynote speaker. Um, Audrey mentioned that this picture actually represents network learners. Well, it could, actually, because Interestingly, if you can send information one way, you can send it the other way as well, can't you? And that means that this could represent network learning. But what I'm trying to, um, to get at here is actually we need to break out of the old models that we're thinking of and start thinking about disruptive pedagogies. You see, when it, new technologies are introduced into conservative environments, students often take them and run with them and they learn new ways to use them. But embarrassingly, often it's not the case with teachers. Teachers cannot find new ways to use them because they're still stuck in the old mindsets, or they haven't got time, or they haven't got the energy to, to change things. Classic case of that is the, um, the smart board. Other brands are available. But the smart board, interestingly, was introduced into schools several years ago as a government initiative. And what did teachers do with it? They did two things. They wrote on it and they projected on it, just like they would with an old whiteboard. So we've got this problem of, of being stuck in the old mindset, psychological problem. Here's my background. Um, in 1970, I went to this building here. Anyone know what it is? I think Stephen probably will, because he lives near there, doesn't he? But who else knows what, what this is? Anyone? You live there too, yeah. yeah. It's the Evolion, the Philips, Philips Flying Saucer, we used to call it. And, and in those days, it was a technology and science museum. And I went there as a, as a kid at school, and I was amazed by what I saw. And that inspired me to become what, what I am today, a learning technologist. I started off you know, my work in 1976, before it was called learning technology. Uh, in those days, we, we called it media and audiovisual. And, uh, and I, I started off by using these type of technologies here the clicker works. Um, that guy there looks like he's obviously enjoying his job, doesn't he? Um, but uh, I, I saw this in 1970 at the Philips Evolio, and I saw this demonstration of, of what can now be only called video conferencing. Uh, you had a television and a camera and a microphone in one room, and you could sit in there and see your mates down the other room and say hello to them and all sorts of stuff. At the same time, Star Trek had just come out. And of course, uh, all of this was, was you know, happening on the screen in front of you. And, and it, it really inspired me. And it inspired a lot of other people as well. And uh, then, of course, these things came along. I, I, was, I, I joined in 1976 at a place called the College of St. Mark and St. John's, which was a teacher training college at the time. still is. It's now a university. And uh, we taught students how to use these things. So open real open real machines, um, you know, video as well as audio, and, and things like the, the Banda Spirit Duplicator. Those things were evil. E more evil than the dark bot. They were really evil. Because they were full of spirit, and of course, when you gave them to the students, the students sniffed them and went, hi. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that, was, that was something to, uh, to behold. But um, we had to teach uh, students how to use these things as well before they went into, into school. The 16mm Bell and Howell projector, and, and the, the VHS cassette had, had come out around about 1980 or 1979. And uh, the, the Betamax, which beat it hollow in terms of quality, but um, never really took off. All of this really is transmission stuff. It's all teacher tools. And then suddenly, something happened. Computers came in. 
I remember building a, um, a PC from, from <laughs> Kitform, and it was, it was huge. The PC, the PC itself was huge, and it had about uh, 128K in it. And the, and the tiny little green screen monitor on top was, was, was how you looked at it and how it worked. Um, but you see, when Cupidus came in, things started to change. And the BBC B, remember that one? What's that one? The ZX Spectrum? Remember, what was that? Space Invaders? CFAX? All of this information explosion suddenly happened. And, and people were starting to use it for their own for their own means, rather than having it transmitted to them. Uh, you could you could actually buy one of these things and learn to program it. And then, of course, along comes the World Wide Web. That's a picture from the Olympics opening ceremony, as you probably remember. And what we've suddenly got is 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 um, a sea on which to to send all these ships around. And people start to connect with each other. People start to participate more. People start to become more social in their learning. It becomes for everyone. And more up to date now, we start to look at technologies which connect us, which allow us to collaborate, which allow us to interact. And eventually we get to this stage where I suppose you could say now that technology is very student-centered, it's very learner-centered, it's very user-centered. So where does that leave us? Because you see, one of the abiding themes of any Alt-C conference, and I've been to quite a few now, it always reoccurs, is what are we doing with technology? How can we make it effective? How does it influence pedagogy? These are big questions. And hopefully by the end of these three days, you'll go away inspired, you'll go away uh, maybe challenged as well. But the problem is you've got to go back to your own environment then. Will you still feel inspired when you get back there and you meet the same old problems again? Well, the thing is, you've got an alt community which you can connect with and, and, uh, and, and talk with, and, and obviously we support each other. So it's a very difficult job that we're in. But um, I'm looking at trends, you see, that um, I've seen over the last few years emerging, and, and, and one of these trends is that because of the technologies that students are bringing in with them now, I think education, particularly in higher education, it, it's, it's going from teacher-led to, to learner-led. The learners are taking more responsibility uh, for their own learning there. And you're going to hear some examples of, of that from, some, from my two um, students when they come up and speak later on. We're going to have a conversation with you about this. Um, I, I often use the Mandelbrot set. You're probably familiar with this, especially if you're a mathematician. The Mandelbrot set is basically um, it's a recursive a towards infinity type of mathematical equation. Uh, every, every version of it gets smaller and smaller, but it's a, it's a unique, uh, it's, it's a similar version of itself. Um, and, and this is very much like the education that we see still going on in many of our schools and certainly in some of the universities that I've worked within. Um, what we should be doing is moving towards discursive approaches to education, which are different each time. Instead of reproducing knowledge, we should be pursuing new knowledge. And uh, there's an example of this from a, a secondary school. So the student is explained this, this equation. You can see it over here. You've got infinity on the right-hand side there. And so then the teacher says, I tried to check to see if she really understood that. And I gave her another example, a different one. And that's what she got. <laughs> it's very recursive, isn't it? Repetition, and, and of course you get problems when you don't understand the problem. The problem becomes the problem. Um, so we've, we've got to be careful that, that we don't reproduce knowledge and, and, and lose people. We've got to, I think, um, be responsible with education and start thinking about how we're going to be more discursive and how we're going to draw out people more and think, get them thinking critically and get them thinking in, in various ways that uh, we couldn't think when we were at school or university. Um, we're going from analog to digital. Nicholas Negroponte talked in 1995 about um, atoms becoming bits. And that's a really important distinction, I think. Um, atoms take a lot of time and energy and, 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 uh, and so on to move around, whereas digital is instant. It also has attributes to it which can improve the content as well. Uh, we're going from closed to open. Now, I, I know that um, I'd I've got to be careful because Martin's in the um, Martin Weller is in the audience somewhere, and he said the other day that we're, we've won the battle for open, but it doesn't feel like we have. 
and you can, you can talk to him about what he means by that later on, but I think we're kind of halfway there myself. We're, we're looking at um, going more open with our education, aren't we? Um, a lot of my content is, is, is repurposable. I, I, um, all my images and, and um, photographs and um, text and so on that I, sent out, that I send out, that I publish, is under Creative Commons, and it can be used again without my permission. And that reaps some interesting rewards. The other day I, I, um, I saw that someone had translated one of my blog posts into Spanish. And uh, it put it up in, on, on their own website and uh, directed people back to my website. And uh, suddenly my blog traffic increased because the whole of Latin America woke up to the fact that I was writing about education. And that was a real um, bonus for me. I didn't expect that, but it happens when you become more open. Open scholarship, I think, is going to be important for all of us. Should we open ourselves up to criticism as well? I think we should. I think we're all responsible for what we believe and what we say and what we do as educators. Um, this is an interesting picture. I took this on the way into work the other day. They cordoned off this telephone. I don't know whether they're going to demolish it or repair it or whatever, but we're going much more from tethered, aren't we, to mobile. Um, how many of you have got a mobile device in here today that's internet enabled? How, forest of hands. How many of you got two? Still a forest of hands. Three? Uh, less, but still a few. I mean, you see, uh, there are more mobile devices in the world now than there are people, and you're why. That's happening. Yeah? <laughs> Aren't you really? Um, but um, the first mobile phones were huge. They were, I, I remember having one. They were huge. Um, actually, um, miniaturization is quite an important process because it does allow us to be more, uh, things to be more portable. It allows us to move around the ambient learning approaches. Um, this couples in with distance education. It couples in with e-learning. All of this together, I think, is where we're going with these trends. Um, another one that I, I see happening is going from standardized to personalized. We're not quite there yet. This is a story of an architect who designed a university, and they said to him, okay, um, the students are coming next week, and the staff are all in. Where are the roads? Where are the pathways? He said, wait. And they said, what do you mean, wait? He said, wait. And the students and the, and the staff all came in, and they made their own pathways, and then and when they'd finished, he paved it over. It's design against user experience, isn't it, really? That's the difference. Desire pathways, I think, is, an, is another important development in higher education where we should be heading. Um, the idea that, that knowledge becomes experience allows you to join the dots up. But when, in fact, you let young people and, and students decide for themselves what pathway they're going, and then you start to see the creativity emerging, and they join the dots up in different ways that you didn't even anticipate. And I think that's part of the exciting thing about being in higher education today. Um, we're going from isolated to connected. We know this. Uh, we're trending on Twitter. We have been for the last half an hour. Did you know that? alt is trending on Twitter. Um, and it will continue to do so because we are connected and we want to share what we've learned with other people who are connected to us. It's part of our culture now. And that's going to increase as well. Uh, it's about creating your personal learning network. You can imagine this guy here next to the table over there. He's connected to three people. That's not really a network. But bearing in mind that each of those is probably connected to somebody else as well, then suddenly you've got a network of experience, a network of learning, and it becomes incredibly powerful. And this is exactly what I do with my students. I show them that actually Twitter is not a tool for mum and dad. It's actually a tool they can use for themselves as well. And uh, we have a back channel going in many of our live lectures and seminars and so on. And if students are separated by seminars, they can connect with each other and, and compare what they're learning in the same seminars in parallel with each other. And, and uh, it, it wasn't, I think it was about four years ago, um, some of my students were talking about one of the books that I had recommended as set reading for one of my modules. And it was on Twitter, and I looked at it, and so I put it onto the screen in front of me. And... Uh, they mentioned the author's name, and so I, I tweeted it, and of course, I know full well that the author's following me on Twitter. He's in America. Within 20 minutes, the author was actually live on the screen talking to the students about the book. And they went. And they couldn't believe that the author that they were studying was actually, you know, directly interacting with them, with Twitter. It's an amazing tool, isn't it? Um, we talk about Connectivism, we talk about, it's not so much what you know anymore, but who you know. It's who you connect to that's important. And I think that's another trend that we're seeing. EdChat, you probably know about. Who's, who's been involved with EdChat? <coughs> Some of you. 
Um, it's a regular event. In fact, it, it's not just an event. It, it's, it's ongoing. It happens all the time. One that we recently set up, and I hope Amy Burval's watching in, in America, we set up a, a challenge over the summer, uh, the two of us, called Blimage, which is basically a meologism blog and image. You send someone an image, they write a blog, a learning-related blog about it, and then they challenge three other people with another image and so on, and it becomes a kind of a, a cloud-based um, environment where everyone starts talking to each other and everyone starts to reflect on images. Everyone starts to think metaphorically. Everyone starts to think critically. And before you know it, you've got a whole body of knowledge out there. I think there's just over 200 blog posts so far. The Dutch have really run with it. They've got over uh, 80 or 90 blog posts so far. Blimage NL. Um, we've done the same with Blidio recently, which is obviously blog video. You see how it's done, can't you? It's very interesting. But the, the point is, um, a lot of these um, people who have been doing these blogs have discovered other bloggers who they never knew existed. And their own traffic, visitor traffic, has gone up as well as a result of it. Um, it's become a very creative process. Uh, it's all about connection. And... Um, Oh, there we are. I'm going to introduce my students at this point. I'd like you to welcome Kate and Becca. <laughs> microphones. I'll give you some microphones. Yep. There we go. Now, Becca and, St uh, Becca and um, Kate actually came up yesterday with me and uh, one of them's my star student over this one here because she's a Manchester United fan. Right. Put your hand up if you're a United yeah. fan. Three. There's a yeah. oh. But this one here's a troublemaker. She's Man City. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but uh, we're going to have a conversation, I think, essentially. And, and please feel free to join in with us because I want the student voice to be heard here. I've been spouting on about what I think are the trends, but I'd like them to tell you themselves what the trends are. And I'd like you maybe to question them as well and, and find out for yourself what Learner 2.0 looks like. These guys were, were uh, born in the 90s. Weren't you? Yes. Yes. And um, really, do you remember the last century? No, not at all. Not really, no. Well, you wouldn't, would you? Could you be too young? Um, take a seat if you like or wander um, before around. Before we start, I just, because yeah. this is like the um, first ever time we've ever spoken in front of this many people and the first time we've been to this uh, conference, we would quite like to take a selfie with you all. <laughs> um, I got this for my birthday. It's a brilliant thing. It's a selfie stick. So, what I've got to put, put this with. down. Right, okay. If you don't like yeah. selfies, so you might want to put your head down now. <laughs> <laughs> it's right out. <laughs> Steve, do you want to get on this? Oh, must I? Okay. Right. Uh, well, I'll, I'll... Just... <laughs> Are you ready for this? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, right. Right, well, look, we got that out of the way then. Okay, right, now, um, interestingly, um, I heard this the other day. Um, I'd like to hear your opinions on this. It, uh, apparently, the digital birth of children is six months now. All right. Um, in other words, that's when young people first start to appear on the web. Probably pictures from their parents who've taken them, put them on Facebook. I actually dispute that because I received this um, picture from Steve Anderson the other day in America. It's a girl, and of course, that's an ultrasound picture. So children are appearing on the web even before they're born now. Is that going to be a significant thing, do you think? What, what, what does it mean to you that, that we appear on the web even before we realise that we're appearing on the web? I see it all the time. Um, I, don't, I think it's, yeah, it's frequent now, isn't it? I think um, we're kind of at the age now where, well, I am anyway, I'm 22. So I'm kind of getting towards that age where some of my friends are like having children and things like that. Um, I see it loads, like people putting scans on. And I think... Um, if you, you know, if you challenge people about it, I don't think they really have a, you know, understand what that actually kind of means. You know, you're starting that sort of digital footprint before your child even has a choice. I don't know whether that's like kind of an ethical issue. I don't really know. Mm. But it's literally like a diary. Every day I see yeah. a photo. Oh, they're walking. Oh, they're... And of course, yeah. it's more or less permanent. This is something I think you might want to discuss later on. Ethically, I think it's, a, it's an important issue. We'll come back to that one, I think, in terms of what we, what we now call uh, digital uh, footprint or digital reputation. There are lots of issues here, I think, to emerge. Here's another one. Um, this is from Alec Kuros. Um, he talks about children not only consuming, now young people not only consuming, but also remixing existing content, um, as I suppose uh, sharing it and, and producing their own content as well. There's a lot of that going on. And he, he talks about learning changing as a result of that. 
What, what do you think about that? Is that something you actually do? Are you familiar with that yourselves? Oh, um, yeah. Um, I think... Why? Uh, well, what, what is it you're doing? I mean, I consume knowledge at university, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then, for example, blogging and things, I then um, consume that knowledge and produce it onto a blog in my own thoughts. And When you actually blog, what does that do to your kind of thinking about what you're studying? It helps um, us, like, collect our thoughts, I yeah. think. You kind of... You can take as many notes and things as you like, but I think if you then go away and reproduce it how you see it kind of thing. I think that kind of helps us to... And then again, I will go back to that um, when yeah. I'm writing my assignments. And again, I then reproduce it again to make sure that obviously it's academic standard and things. But it's just that constant thought process. And obviously, again, things are changing and more update research has been done. And I keep reproducing it. So it means it back to the it. provisionality of it means you can re re remix it all yeah. the time and, re yeah. and um, keep, keep adding to it. Um, Here's, a, here's a, uh, something I often show people. This, this is the three biggest fears of teachers using technology. And I'd like you to contrast this to the three biggest fears of students using technology. And here's the difference. That's so true. <laughs> so true. Does that resonate with you out there? Yeah? I'll go back. There you go again. Yeah. Yeah? Can I just say though, Steve? The, yeah. This first one here. Yeah. We're both trainee teachers. Right. Now, the other one, with the Wi-Fi and stuff, like I said, so true. Get that all the time. Um, the first thing we did when we got to the hotel yesterday was go to Wi-Fi. Yeah, do we have Wi-Fi? <laughs> um, but the one before that, I mean, personally now, if I'm using, or if I'm at home, or if I'm at university or whatever, I, I don't have a fear with technology. But as soon as I am on placement and I'm you know, trying to teach, I am. I, I, it's kind of that environment that you're in, I think. As soon as I become Miss Bartlett, that, yeah. It's like you st step in as like a computing leader or something and you see people are like, how do you fix a projector? And I don't have a clue. But yeah. it's, then you do know how to connect to Wi-Fi. I think maybe it's that just... expectation that you, you should know and maybe you might know it, but I think it's just the expectation that you do that's quite scary. So really we're not talking about age here then. We're talking about Definitely context. not. Definitely not. Which I, I find fascinating. I mean, this relates to me to the, um, to the work of uh, White and Lacornu, the, um, the digital residents and visitors theory, which really knocks natives and immigrants into a top hat, doesn't it, really? Um, you, know, you know the natives and immigrants theory. Um, I, I find that, that really difficult to, 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 um, to swallow because um, in, in terms of Prensky's ideas, I, I'm an immigrant. I can, take, I can talk t technology, but I teach. I, I talk it with an accent. You know, I can't get rid of the accent. You know, because I, I'm struggling with it. Whereas these guys are supposed to be adept at, and yet they've just told you that when they go into a context where they are the teacher, they sometimes struggle with the technology. So, so I think we are looking more at, at a context-based thing than an age-based thing uh, with, with this kind of approach to, um, to using technology. I'm going to move on swiftly because we're going to run out of trouble. Look at this. <laughs> and you can do the same with other old technologies as well. You know, it, it, it's, uh, the, the problem is, you see, young people have a, a very uh, narrow kind of point of reference. I was sat on a train the other day, I tell, I, I tell you no lie, and there were two secondary school boys sat next to me on the other side of, of, the, of the aisle, and they were talking about Sherlock Holmes. And one said, oh, I, I love the new Sherlock, don't you? You know, the, you know, the one with Benedict Cumberbatch and, and Martin Freeman. I love that. And, and his mate uh, turned to me and said, yes, it's very good. He said, but um, he said, I prefer the, um, the classic version of Sherlock Holmes with Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, you can see that the, the reference is, is narrower. And, and uh, of course, young people don't understand old technologies, but they do know what to do with the new technologies when they've got them in the right context. What do you think? Is, is there anything you want to say about that? Or anything anyone wants to say? We've got some microphones here. We can start the conversation. I think you're taking the mick out of young people, to be honest, Steve. <laughs> I don't like it very much. Mm. So. <laughs> well. I'm only joking. She'd have to. So I'm marking her assignment next. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> Be my best right. But um, I, I think we'll, we'll move on and we'll look at something else here because um, th this is quite an interesting image in itself. Um, and it's not what you'd expect, but I think I, I see this a lot. My, my, my father is actually 87 years old now. And a few years ago, I introduced him to Facebook. 
And uh, he called me over recently and said to me, Steve, what does this mean here? And he put a post out, and underneath it, it said 54K. And I said, Dad, you've got 54,000 likes. I was spitting lead. I can't even get 100. <laughs> you know? But he had 54,000 likes because he tapped into um, some uh, mainstream Facebook uh, discussion without realizing it and had posted something which was really evocative and 54,000 people had come in. He's a big celebrity now on Facebook. <laughs> but he still doesn't know how to talk it. <laughs> he used um, uh, an expression the other day. Um, it, what happened was he, um, he, had, to, he had to explain um, to my, my, uh, my grandchildren that... Um, that uh, uh, his sister had died, and he said, I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you that Auntie Edna passed away in her sleep last night, and we were all very sad. LOL. <laughs> and of course, my, my daughter was incensed. She said, you can't say that, Grandad. It means laughing out loud. He said, no, I didn't mean it that way. I thought it was lots of love. <laughs> so, so there are language differentials we've got to be careful of, aren't there, really? I mean, um, so, so go away and look up P999 now, okay? This is a good one for you to look up. Some of you know what that means already. You probably know what it means. But, but uh, people of my generation don't unless you look it up. So there is this, this, this interesting conundrum. When you put several generations together in the same digital space and you share it, there are, di there are, there are kind of um, different narratives going on. There are different uh, versions of, of, of language and, and barriers that, that, that are put up against it. This is what I see happening a lot now. Do you see that? I do, but I just wish students like us could afford Apple Macs. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like one of our lecture halls. Other devices are available. Other devices yes. are available. We said that. Absolutely. Oh, Bob, thank you, Bob. Yeah, doesn't mean they're any good. Doesn't mean they're any good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but I think I think what we're trying to the, the, the point we're trying to make here, really, regardless of the the, the tool, is that. Students now have personal windows on the world. Uh, when I was at university, I wasn't able to do anything other than make notes and ask questions, if I was allowed to. Now I can Google what's happening. I was actually sat up there about I, I, when Martin Bean was speaking. Um, when was that? About um, 2009, was it? 2000, yeah, 2009. And uh, I remember sitting up at the back there, and he'd finished his keynote, and then down at the front row somewhere here, another Australian academic got up and mentioned who he was and where he came from and asked the question. At the back, everyone at the back Googled this guy to see who he was. And I thought, no one is really anonymous on the web anymore, are they? This is one of these things that, that we're now having to deal with. But um, Can I on. say as well, Steve, that with this, we have some lecturers at university who are really... Um, against, I guess, the use yeah. of technology. If, you know, if that was happening, I think they'd probably... We've actually had it before, haven't we? We've been asked to put our devices away. I think that's kind of the divide that there is now. I think you know, someone who maybe isn't so you know, into technology and things might look at that and think that we're all ignoring, ignoring the lecture and you know, just on Facebook or you know, internet shopping or whatever, um, if we have money. Um, but we're not. I think you know, it's, it is that divide and it's that understanding of maybe you know, what we actually use technology for in a lecture. Again, it's a psychological, it's a mindset problem, isn't it? Um, some yeah. people will, will see the, the, the value, others think of it as a threat. Um, and I'm sure that um, someone wants to ask a question, actually, in the middle here. We need well, microphones. Yeah. Um, and, uh, most of these things have, are, are a two-way conversation. Yeah. Um, and the, the interesting thing about our identities that you were challenging um, is that actually most teachers, the best teachers are the best learners, and the best learners are the best teachers. And we, yeah. we're never one identity. And just as you know, you're, you're confident and happy with technology until you put it in front of people who are going to eat you alive and it doesn't work, yeah. they're suddenly responsible for their access to technology, and it flips. So we do <coughs> context define who we are, how we react to technology, and you know, somebody who one. Um, uh, one moment is, is, is Googling the letter and you know, a great student is engaged. The next millisecond, if they're, you know, most people are, are, are shopping, yeah. have got an email in, and are distracted, mm. and are actually part of your lecture anymore. They've stepped mm. into another world and another personality. Mm. Mm. And um, our, our desire to control that may be, may be wrong and may be challenging to the mm. people we're around, but mm. uh, it is probably a necessary part of. Um, the way that we interact with each other, because we don't tend to like people um, you know, turning around in a walking mm. way and talking. Mm. And that is something, mm. that, that's something else that technology gives mm -hmm. us all the time. And okay. That's the freedom and it's a good thing. 
I hope that was got on the um, on the webcast. Um, if not, we'll need to put the microphone around, won't we? Because uh, we need to get get people to pick up what's being said here, so that people outside can hear this. But uh, good point, and um, it is it's still all about context. Um, we learn by doing, said uh, Piaget. We also learn by making. I, I don't know if you want to say anything about what you're doing through learning through making at all. Do you? Um, well, we're always using equipment and stuff at university, and I think it definitely benefits our learning. Uh, massively, and again, then you go and tweet it out or whatever, and you're constantly learning and blogging and things in order to like collate that learning, I guess. Being primary school teachers, yeah. you're going to have to learn all the topics. Yeah. You, have, you have to teach all the topics. Did you know that? Uh, a primary school teacher teaches every topic. They're not like a secondary school teacher who, who uh, specialises. How does that help the multidisciplinarity of it for you? Does it help at all? I think a lot of technology these days, you can see how the technology can be used in a broad range of subjects. So learning deeply into one type of learning by making and using these tools, you can use it in so many different subjects and that really helps us as primary school teachers, especially with like SEN children and all those, you know, uh, different mm. aspects. It really does help by making and little children love learning with their hands and things. So. You recognise these students, don't you? These are the, the group that have just uh, qualified and, and these three students here um, were, were creating a video because they were, they were exploring theories of learning. And the best way they thought of to actually learn it was to actually create the video and then show it and get some criticism from their, from their peer group. And I think that was, that was quite um, a brave of them, I think, to actually do that, to open themselves up to criticism from the rest of their group. But that's what they did. And I, I'm assuming that you do something very similar to that. Do you do make videos? Yeah, we have some videos and things, haven't we? Yeah. Which are available on YouTube if you'd like to go and check them out. Um, yeah, but you do, you, put, you, you do put yourself sort of out there for, you know, comments and discussion, which can be quite scary at first, but um, it's good, you know, that's how you, it's how you learn, is through that discussion, so. We're going to move on again. Um, I'm just going to talk about briefly about the tools and the technologies uh, and, and the idea of user-generated content. Um, some people I know complain about Wikipedia. A lot of my colleagues, um, and you know who I'm talking about, will say, you know, I'm not going to allow my students to use Wikipedia as a reference because dot, dot, dot. Do you have a response to that? Do you use Wikipedia at all? And if so, how do you use it? Um, a bit scared to say. I, I, do, I, do, um, I do look at Wikipedia. I'm quite um, careful. I don't know. It depends. It's all about context, I guess. If you, if you mention it in the context of that it is Wikipedia and it might not be completely, you know, factual or... You know, if you state where you've got it from, I think it's okay. I mean, it's just so, it's just such an easy website to, to use. It's just there, and like, it's just got the information on it. But you, you do have to just be careful about what you use. Because I, I tend to use it as a first point of call, um, and then sort of go to that. You know that Wikipedia will like know the, the basics, yeah. And then you go and you go to the academics and stuff for the additional research. That's how I tend to use it. But I'll, I'll be interested to hear what. The audience thinks about Wikipedia as, as a tool for learning. Um, maybe some, there's, a, there's a, 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 somebody down here who needs to bring the microphone to him, and, and one at the back over there as well. Go on. Uh, my boy's eight, actually. Uh, last year, I was immensely proud the first time he did some homework by uh, cutting and pasting from Wikipedia. I thought that was very impressive. I mean, he identified what he needed to find. He uh, dragged it and dropped it into the word processor and printed it. And uh, yeah, that seemed to me as, as good a feat as copying anything out of it. So a, basic of ICT book. skills and, and editing. Yeah, yeah. and finding, and it even open, he'd even used open mm. license materials. So. Mm, interesting. And uh, somebody at the back over here. Yeah, can you say who you are, Marin? Marin needs to be obeyed. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Roger Harrison, University of Manchester. Um, one of the things I often come across is that people think that um, what already existed um, is perfect, so then you are comparing people who say, oh yes, well Wikipedia, you know, that has problems of because you don't know the source of the authorship and all those types of things. But we know that the British Medical Journal and the Lancet also publishes work which has problems with it too. So, so we sort of think what, already, what we already do, for, for example, in a non-technological perspective, is perfect. So then other things that we're introducing, you know, can't be as good as. Hmm. 
Interesting. We have someone down here, I think, who wants to say something. And also, um, what, while we're waiting for the microphones to go around, what, what would happen then, uh, guys, if, I, if, if in our next semester I set you a task as a group to go away and create a new Wikipedia page on a new topic which doesn't exist yet, how, how hard or easy would that be? Um, I think it's a lot harder, actually, to get something onto Wikipedia than people might think, because I've not tried it personally, but I know that it has to be verified by somebody. You can't just put anything mm -hmm. on it. So it does have to, I don't know who that person is, but it does have to be verified by someone. Um, I don't know. Perhaps we should do that. Mm. That sounds quite good. Has anyone ever done that? Over here, several people have. And I'll be interested in talking to you afterwards. We haven't got time now to actually find out what the results were. Um, comment from over here. Yeah, I really wanted to both... Um, is it Becker on the right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I like your Wikipedia first point, and that, but also emphasising behind. I mean, the, the skill that we, we sort of didn't have to teach in the past because we assumed sort of all the science was right, yeah, uh, was the actual critical skills of actually working out what's right. I spent half my time debunking things on, on Facebook nowadays, just looking at the facts behind, and yeah. you typically find it. And again, perhaps reflecting back, I mean, that's seems to be, but isn't necessarily what's happening, one of the critical skills that, that we need to have going forward, and, and perhaps more so than in the past, but perhaps highlighted by, what we, by the fact that we go to Wikipedia to know that we actually ought to do the same when we go to the British Medical Journal or Nature or, or wherever we're looking. Thank you very much. I, I, the critical skills, I think, is the, is the key word there. Um, this, this kind of thing happens a lot. This is students taking notes, clearly. Um, I know you guys do, guys do this. What do you do with the pictures afterwards? A lot of my colleagues say to me, Look, that's not learning. What, so what, what happens next probably is, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't always just take the picture and just forget about it. Um, I personally, I use Evernote, the app. Um, and, you know, that has the capacity to store your notes and your pictures and things. So, I mean, if, if there's like a, a whole page of notes, you don't have time in a lecture to sit and write them all down or even type it down. So the easiest thing usually to do is to take the picture and just import it into my document and it's just there for me to use later. I don't know if you do anything different. Um, I feel as well like taking that picture, you've got the slide, but then if the lecturer is speaking about off topic type, you know, you want to take notes on that as well. So I tend to spend time taking notes like what, about what Steve is saying, but also taking a photo of the slide so then you've got that to refer back to also. So I think there's a kind of a new digital literacy, the idea of interpreting images and reflecting on them, melding together other content so that you've got a new whole, I suppose, really, that allows you to explain or understand things better. Bob, you've got a comment down here. Thank you. Bob Harrison, ALT member and chair of governors at Northern College. I'd like to ask your opinion about assessment and technology because uh, Kieran, my uh, stepson, just graduated from Leicester University and uh, having spent the last three years working on keyboards or touch screens or whatever, was asked to sit down and write for three hours using a pen and uh, a paper. And um, my, my friend and colleague Steve Heppel describes that as somebody learning to drive in a Formula One car, being asked to ride a horse for assessment. Yeah. Could, could you say something about your views on that? Um, well, for us, luckily, we don't have exams. Um, but It's all coursework. Yeah. I, is, I mean, I just literally use technology for my assessments for assignments and things. So it's difficult for me to say about exams and things. But... We are going over this year completely in Plymouth to um, online submission of assignments. I don't know who else has done that already. Um, one or two people, perhaps. Um, we're ahead of the curve in some ways and behind in other ways. But um, that's going to raise all sorts of issues. What, what about online assessment? We can't wait. <laughs> yeah, you, you, uh, th you think that's a good thing? Yeah. Why, why do you think it's a good thing? Do you want to... I think we're most excited, but that may be because we are, you know, technology, you know, computing students, so, you know. I mean, some people don't like the idea of it because they think it might fail. Um, you know, you might not actually be able to submit it. I don't know. You know, again, it's just, it's the attitudes towards technology. I mean, the actual, you know, process of online submission, mm. to me, is a good idea, but to other people, maybe not so. We're certainly moving from atoms to bits. That is one classic example of that. Um, 
Well, while we're thinking about that, we'll move on to student maker spaces. I think that's on someone's bingo list as well, actually. Student maker spaces. Uh, I, I'll just tell you a quick story about this. Um, I, heard, I heard about a secondary school who recently um, uh, wanted to enthuse their students into making and fixing things. And so what they did was they, uh, one of the teachers set up uh, a broken computer. It was a computer and all its components were separate from each other. And they, they put it on a table outside uh, in the corridor and they put a sign next to it saying, whoever fixes this and brings it to my office uh, will win a prize. Within 24 hours, a student proudly brought it working to the teacher's office. He was so excited he forgot to claim his prize. Then five minutes later, a whole group of boys said, well, he was too quick, we want to do the same thing. Give us a challenge too. Then a whole load of girls came to the door and said, we think we can do that quicker than the boys. And suddenly the whole school was enthused about making and fixing and, and, and designing and solving problems and so on. And uh, it was a very exciting time for them. Um, that's something that I believe we're trying to set up now in, in the Institute of Education at Plymouth. We're going to be doing these little pop-up shows where we can, um, we can put together things like Makey Makey. Anyone heard of Makey Makey? Um, it's a, you've, explain Makey Makey if you know what it is. I'm sure you do. Um, I, I, I won one, actually, a, a raffle. Um, the only raffle I've ever won. And um, it's like a credit-sized card um, sort of... D yeah, device, yeah. and you use um, crocodile clips, as they're known in primary school, um, to like um, attach the wires to your computer and any random object. So a banana, I've made a banana piano, um, and that has gone down a storm in primary schools. Um, and they're, they're just amazed at what you can actually make. So you can connect it to your stairs and make piano stairs and all sorts. It's, it's really good. So basically you're taking um, objects and turning them into the Internet of Things. Yes, basically. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, interesting. Um, so, so there's that. Um, what, one final slide before we finish. Um, this is the work of John Waters. And um, it's from several years ago now, but he identified all these key characteristics for what we call new learners. And um, let's go through these to see, to see if he, he's accurate or not. I mean, I'm sure you've looked at this list already and thought about it. But I'm going to ask you now, the first one. Um, are you more self-directed, do, do you think, than, than um, you were in school? Yes. Yes. In what ways? Um, I, I use the internet basically as Vygotsky's knowledgeable other. Um, as so he becomes your scaffold? Yeah. He, that becomes your scaffold yeah. on the web? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's more so now less than school, but not because technology's progressed in school, but say I was in school now, I think a lot of schools are um, a lot more reluctant to let children use devices. Um, this is just a bit of a plug for you, actually, Steve. Steve wrote an article the other day that got into the Western Morning oh, News sorry. about using smartphones in school. Um, basically about how a lot of schools and teachers are, you know, don't like it, but I think since coming to university it's encouraged and, yeah, become a lot more self-directed, definitely. The one I really am interested in is the third one down. Are you actually more reliant on feedback from your peers? Do you, do you actually um, appreciate that more? Yes. Why? I find that interesting. Because I think now it's not even so... I mean, we see each other every day at university anyway, and we all live quite close to each other, like our peer group within our specialism, but we have our own Facebook chat, we have our own Twitter hashtag, we have our own everything. So even if we're not together, we can still communicate. Yeah, we are. We can still communicate all the time. Um, and we do. We rely on that all the time with each other. You know, when we're having assignments to hand in, constantly talking to each other, aren't we? Tens of thousands of messages have, have happened. Yeah. And, and, and the, the last one there, I'm going to skip the other ones. The last one, more oriented towards becoming your own nodes of production. What does that mean to you? I think it means being able to, uh, what's the word, like being more motivated, I guess, to kind of learn yourself and not have to rely on a teacher, you know, you become, you know, I mean, like in a lecture, for example, um, if you're talking about something and you mention someone's name, because we've got, we might go off and, oh, I want to find out more about that person, and you might write that down, and obviously, you know, the technology helps us to do that. I don't know, yeah, what do you think? I think it's going back to blogging and things again. Um, yeah, you are more inclined to do what interests you the most, and that interest, I find, is always a better way of learning. Because you have written lots of blog posts between you, haven't you, really? I mean, yeah. um, and uh, do, do you get actually feedback on those? Yeah, you... and I've had so many people say, do you mind if I put this on my Facebook page or something? To And it, you'd be surprised how many like comments and things you have, and likes and whatever. To And it really, like, it makes you, like, it's going back to that peer assessment and things, it makes you feel like that you're doing, you're on a long, there, along the right, the right tracks and things, and yeah. 
Right, well, I'm going to um, blank the screen there at that point and, um, and just try and sum up with, with this. We, I think we are seeing a, a, new, a shift in learning. Um, we're seeing um, younger people coming in with, with, with new ways that they're learning, which we never had opportunity to do when we were at university. And I think we're also seeing um, a whole range of, 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 um, of conflicts going on between what lecturers are trying to do and what students actually want to do or need to do. Um, I think there's a bit of a rift or, or, or a, sh a, a kind of a, a gap appearing between um, students' intentions and, 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 uh, and, and lecturers' actions. And uh, I hope, hopefully that, that will be something that we can debate further throughout this, um, this conference. I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening to us. Steve, uh, thank you very much for setting the tone with our opening keynote. Uh, lots of things for us to be thinking about and um, uh, let the conversation carry on. Can I just uh, give you a thank you present to each one of you and also Becca and Kate, thank you very much as well. Well, that has kicked us off to what I'm hoping